Okay, so today's walk is Every Stone Tells a Story, The Jewish Merchants of Main Street. And like all of the walks, they were developed with a grant from the St. John Community Arts Board. And this grant was from June, 2021. So this walk was adapted from an historical walk given in the Sherazetic Cemetery as part of the Walks and Talks program coordinated by David Goss. And I did a version of this walk on July 17th, 2018. So Main Street Merchants, did you know that the St. John City directories from the 1870s to the 1990s listed more than 200 different Jewish owned businesses in the city? Some of them existed for only a few years and others survived for generations and became institutions. Most of the business owners were men, but for many, they depended on their wives or their daughters to help along with the shop's success. So here are a couple of views of Main Street, uh, both taken from up on Fort Howe, which is probably the only thing in this picture that's still there. Um, but just, I'm sure this will present some memories for you. And did you also know that the stores, well, of course you probably knew this, that the stores were well known for their personal and caring service to their customers regulars and otherwise. Many of these stores carried items not available elsewhere. And sadly, most of these stores disappeared after urban renewal in the 1960s, completely um, wiped out what was on Main Street. So usually when I talk about this, I call it urban removal since they really didn't put a whole lot back. So there are a couple of other pictures of Main Street as it was. The picture on the left looking towards the uptown so you can see where the general hospital was at the very top of Waterloo Street. And on the other side looking west, so St. Luke's Church was still here at the top of Main Street. And there are a few businesses or a few structures on this side of the street on the right hand side heading west that still stand. Um, but there are only, I think, three or four original structures there. So, oops, I'm one slide ahead of myself. So Main Street was the major Jewish business district from 1910 until 1969. And Marcia Coven, who founded the museum, wrote in her book, Weaving the Past into the Present, the street was lined with stores selling clothing, boots, shoes, ladies' hats, ladies' apparel, family clothing, furniture, men's tailoring, the inevitable kosher butcher, a few grocers, and the Bluebird bottling plant, which made kick cola. Next to one of the butcher shops at the foot of Main Street was a room called the Main Street Hall, and this hall was used for prayers twice a day. Mr. Yale Budovich, the father of Meyer Budovich, grandfather of Rose Kaplansky, and Isaac Budovich, and the great-grandfather of Leonard Kaplansky was the custodian of the hall on Main Street, and he kept the stove going in there on the cold winter days. Bernie Bloom, in an interview recorded back in 1987, remembered that the area along and near Main Street was a Jewish ghetto from the 1920s to the 1960s. The area was close to the harbor where many of them had arrived from Eastern Europe not so many years before. The storekeepers lived in the flats on the upper stores, floors above the stores, and on nearby side streets, including High Street, Acadia Street, and Simon Street, all of which are now gone. So this was a truly self-contained neighborhood. And Bernie Bloom remembered that there were more than 65 stores between Douglas Avenue and Paradise Row along Main Street. Although, of course, not all of the stores were Jewish. So let's see who remembers these stores from Main Street. Okay. And keep in mind, I was able to find more information for some businesses than for others. I will admit that I have probably missed a few or perhaps located them in the wrong places. So I'm 
The businesses may have moved around from building to building. So, of course, that building number would change or maybe the numbers changed and the buildings stayed put. So I'm hoping when I'm finished that you can add more to what I have been able to share. So we'll start at the very top of the hill at the corner of Lansdowne Avenue with the Fabric Center. The street address was actually 11 Lansdowne Avenue. So David Shepard opened the Fabric Center in 1950 alongside his wife, Ethel. She came with experience for many years working for Simpsons in Toronto, where she developed her passion for home decorating. And then she carried on with the business after David died in 1967 and finally sold the build business in 1979 before moving to Toronto and to be closer to her children. A story in the newspaper, which you see here, which was published at the time the store was sold, quoted Mrs. Shepard as saying, customers were loyal to the store because of the quality of the material and the customer service. The store did escape fire damage in a December 11th, 1958 fire in a neighboring building at 397 Main Street. The, building, the fire had started when a blowtorch was being used to thaw pipes. This is a story we're all familiar with. The Salvage Corps was able to cover the merchandise in the store with tarpaulins of some sort and saved the store from significant damage. The fire did, however, displace a number of families. And the store moved from Lansdowne Avenue to Union Street by 1965. Uh -huh. um, again, as part of that urban renewal, urban removal situation. Hmm. At 335 Main Street, we have Hoffman's. And I'm going to what I'm using for the basis for this is a story from the 1996 newspaper when this store was celebrating 50 years in business. Huh. And the story begins with what began 50 years ago was an old fashioned general store and tailor shop with yard goods, toys, and knickknacks alongside men's, women's, and children's clothing as shoes has evolved over the years to the Hoffman's we know, home of fashions in the classic manner. So um, women's fashions, Eddie Cohen and Ermini Cohen, a store manager and store buyer, took over the store in 1947, shortly after they married. And they decided that Hoffman's would cater to the woman who appreciates classic tailored clothes that can take her out to the office or out to dinner and that won't be out of style in six months or a year. Hoffman's has dressed three generations of St. John women in the 50 years that it was open. So Eddie and Ermini had personalized service to the extent that calls would be made to regular customers if merchandise of particular interest came in. Or as customers aged, the store staff would bring things to the lady's home and she would do her shopping from the comfort of her living room. So almost taking that peddler, going back to the peddler days, but a little more focused, I guess. Over time, the store expanded from 700 to 3,000 square feet. The store also offered credit to its customers. The earliest limits were about $30, and there was a payment plan of $2 a week. So Hoffman's was very, one of the very last Jewish stores to operate in St. John, and it was the last Jewish store on Main Street when it closed in 1996. So they went out with a bang on their 50th anniversary. And Ermini Cohen got very much involved in the store. One of the anecdotes was when mini skirts came in, he didn't feel very comfortable figuring out how to order those. So he brought in his wife to help him with that and she stayed. And then an advertisement from the store. I mean, there are thousands of them, of course, but I do pull out this one. You can sort of see the progression of styles from the long gowns and the parasol and the morning coats to what's well, almost a mini skirt. So at 362 Main Street, Dr. Joseph Tansman had his medical practice for a short period of time. He was an immigrant child who had arrived with his parents from Europe. So he was at that point an infant, but over time, he did graduate from St. John High School and then from McGill University. And he returned to St. John after 1927 as the city's first Jewish doctor. 
He practiced general medicine in this office on Main Street until the Second World War. And the community lore was that he saw only one patient on his first day in practice. Um, and obviously his practice grew over time. When the war came in 1939, he went overseas as a commander of the 14 Field Hospital. And when he came back after 1945, having seen service throughout Europe, he decided to specialize in obstetrics and gynecology. And he was the chief of staff of the department at the St. John General Hospital. And probably most of us in the, on this Zoom call were probably delivered by Dr. Chansman. And he delivered about 8,000 babies over the course of his career. And he was active in the Jewish and non-Jewish communities throughout the city. Now, Franz Blows, I've got several addresses for, so it does turn up again later, but um, I think this was the second location around 401 Main Street, but it had been further down the street at 685, so it will turn up again. So Max Bransbo came to St. John from Tracadie, New Brunswick, so on the north shore of the province. He was a veteran of the Royal Canadian Air Force during the Second World War. And this grocery store on Main Street was opened after the war. So he started at 685, as I said, then moved to the corner with Lansdowne at 401, which you see here. And then because of urban renewal, moved the store across the harbor to Main Street West in 1970 because he had been dislocated twice by the process. So at the time of the move in 1970, the newspaper ran a story that said, after offering North End residents the best in meats and produce since 1947, Mr. Franz Blow has moved his grocery operation to 19 Main Street West. We've always enjoyed a reputation for good quality meats at reasonable prices. The original store was at 685 Main Street near the old viaduct. And along with another store at the corner of Main Street and Lansdowne Avenue opened in 1965, he built up a thriving business based on offering the best quality products for less cost to the consumer. When forced to make way for the North End Urban, Remo Urban Renewal Program, Mr. Franzblow selected the Main Street West location which has allowed him to expand his operation to the size of a compact supermarket. And the article goes on to talk about how the store has been attractively renovated and the shelving was arranged so the products could be displayed in an easy to find manner for customer convenience. So, and most of these buildings are of course no longer standing. And then the advertisement here, this one, I came across in doing some of the research, but that his ad was forced out of business sale rather than what one would normally expect maybe a going out of business or a relocation sale, but just some of the prices as well that, you know, a 50 pound bag of potatoes is only $1.49. Mm -hmm. uh, a tin of coffee is 79 cents. Um, pink salmon, 69 cents. Dream Whip. 29 cents, um, soup 25 cents. So kind of missed those prices. So a little farther down, we come to 444 Main Street, which was the Regent Theater owned by Joseph Franklin. And there were, were a series of little stories in the newspaper, the Evening Times Globe in March, 1936. And they profiled a lot of businesses in the city, including those on Main Street. So I've got a lot of these little paragraphs about the different businesses on Main Street. Hmm. So in this story, the article notes that the Regent Theater opened for its first shows on October the 29th, 1934 with 874 air cushioned seats for its patrons. Mm. The theater boasted of a modern fireproof building which offered the best sound and projection. And mm. the films were changed three times each week. Joseph Franklin and his son Mitchell, who also owned the Mayfair Theater on Waterloo Street and the Royal Hotel in King Street were in charge of this operation. So, quite a challenge in the depression to operate a uh, film business. And I was listening to something 
last week where during the depression, people didn't have a lot of the extra money for films. And one of the promotions to bring people into the movies was that for your price of admission, you also got a dish, a plate or a bowl or a cup as a promotion to encourage people to go to the films. Now, whether the Franklins embarked on that enterprise or not, I'm not quite sure, but um, they were certainly successful and they brought in films that were changed regularly. And these are just, this is just one of the ads. So Broadway Melodies of 1936 oh. at the Regent and Showboat with Irene Dunn and Alan Jones being shown at the Mayfair. Course, there were hundreds of ads because of the constant changing of the films. So 451 Main Street is the first of a number of the butcher shops that appeared on Main Street. And this one was owned by the Gordon family. Uh, Marcia Coven wrote that the community was able to boast of three kosher butchers. The position of kosher butcher was one that had to be applied for and voted on by the congregation. The man who was awarded the concession had to pay a yearly fee. And it must have been a fairly lucrative business because at times more than one a person applied for this position. And Marcia's mother, Rose Friedman, remembered that there were four kosher butchers at one point. Most ran their shops on Main Street in the midst of the Jewish neighborhood. So men such as David Aronoff, Israel and Morris Kaszewski, David and later Meyer Gordon. And they also had a stall in the St. John City Market. Benjamin Levine, and for a brief period of time, Mr. Schechter. And Mrs. Friedman remembered that the kosher butcher shops were a gathering place in the afternoons for many Jewish women who went shopping twice a week for their family's needs. And Dr. Ben Goldberg, who couldn't be with us today, sent me a little note that he remembered going to the butcher shop with his aunt, Sarah Brim, and they lived on Jermaine Street in the uptown. So they traveled to Main Street by streetcar and they would carry with them one or two live chickens in a potato bag. <laughs> and once the butcher had done his thing with the chickens, they would take the streetcar back uptown to Jermaine Street. So imagine doing that today to get on <laughs> the streetcar or on the bus or the subway with a couple of chickens in a potato bag still squawking. Um, not sure they'd let you on. <laughs> As I mentioned, the Gordons did later have a stall in the St. John City Market. So 509 Main Street, we can find the Grand Department Store, which was started by Morris Coven. And he opened this store in 1935. His son Samuel and Joe worked with him in the store. And the store, just to kind of keep you oriented, or keep me oriented since this is all before my time, it was across from the Lord Beaverbrook rink. So the Grand Department store sold clothing for the entire family. So coats, pants, dresses, shoes, and then bedding, towels, and curtains. And the store went out of business in 1966. So they lasted for 30 years. So they celebrate their anniversary and then they closed. Seems to be a tradition of that. Um, Oh, after the store closed, if we go next door to, oh, well, first of all, here are a couple of advertisements. So their 20th anniversary sale and the pre-Christmas sale, um, probably from the 1950s. So um, ladies pedal Money. pusher, 78 cents. Um, slacks, 89 cents. Boots, $2.99. 99 cents for sneakers. Uh, curtains, 25 cents. Um, ladies, shoe rubbers, 49 cents. Um, nylons, two pairs for a dollar. Um, yeah, I love the prices. <laughs> so after the Grand Department store closed, Joe Colvin went a couple of doors down the street and opened the first self-serve laundromat in St. John, which he called the Ocano Wash and Dry. You can see a line of washers, a line of dryers, detergent dispenser, just what you would expect to find in a laundromat. Um, no laundry, so um, maybe before the 
the store open for the day to take the picture. And then we can move down a bit to 541 Main Street, which was Bernie's Clothing, owned by Bernie Bloom. And he opened this store after his service in the Canadian Army during the Second World War. And read a couple of different things, one suggesting that his merchandise was geared toward the working men of the city, but it may also have been family clothing. The store itself was destroyed by fire in the early 1970s. And rather than rebuilding and reopening, Bernie closed up the shop and went on to work at the ideal store on Union Street until retirement. So we have the announcement of its opening. At, and at that time, it was originally at 573 Main Street. So clearly moved up the street. So again, all this confusion with the numbers of the buildings. So 559 Main Street, we have Ray's Novelty Store, which was opened by Rachel Selby, one of the oh. very few female business owners that been oh. followed in her husband's footsteps. So Rachel Columbus Selby went to work on her own beginning at the age of 14 in 1913 to help out her family. And she sold shoes for six years before she struck out on her own with Ray's Novelty Store. And she opened this store in 1925 on Main Street. She was also at the time one of the few women in the community who was a divorcee. And she used the income from the store to support herself, her son, Alan, and daughter, Anne. And the store later moved down to Dock Street. So 573 Main Street was a location of the People's Store, which was owned by Joseph Stokolsky. And he had started his career after arriving in St. John by repairing umbrellas, something that would be quite essential, I would think, in St. John, because every time it rains, the wind blows. Sharpening knives. Everybody needs knives. And then by selling boots and shoes that he acquired from Eaton's. And there would just be odd lots of boots and shoes. So he would have to try and match them up. And the 1936 newspaper story that I mentioned described the Main Street store this way. Jay Stokolsky is the proprietor of this store, which is located at 573 Main Street, and which carries a complete line of boots, shoes, and dry goods for men, women, and children. Starting in business in 1915 at the present stand, the firm has occupied an important place in the business activity of the North End and enjoys a steady patronage. Uh. And elsewhere in these special pages will be seen special prices which the proprietor is offering in the celebration <laughs> of the 21st anniversary of the business. Okay. We can watch this right. if we're going to come to. They're, they're combining the the cemetery with the chair, the stores. They show the oh. the stores, oh. the store and the. Okay, so we'll move down now to. There oh, are two hundred stores. Two stores for fifty cents. Let's speed it. One day. To the next <laughs> stop, which is we, five seven. We started at the top with Hoffman's. Department store was the first one. Oh, I didn't mention Uncle Benny at all. They just said, uh, please, can you put yourself on mute, please? That's not nice. What? Is that right? They should have. Ladies, do you mind putting yourself on mute so that we can oh. hear Catherine? Oh, sorry. Are we on? Yeah, you're not on mute. So if you could just oh. do that, it would be wonderful. Thanks. Oh. So our next stop is at 587 Main Street, Morris Koshetsky, men's clothing. Now, this one, I didn't find a lot of information about this one. And when I looked in the newspapers and looked up Morris Koshetsky, the only thing I could come up with was that there was a, um, an account of a court case between Morris Koshetsky and William Weber, William Weber, and they had a dispute over the sale of rugs uh, from one to the other in July of 1927. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the rugs had to do with the men's clothing, but perhaps somebody can add a bit to that um, at the end of the walk. But um, there was the question of $333.56 
in the dispute, so a significant amount of money in 1927. But um, I think they did get it sorted out. 596 Main Street was where Abraham Druskin had his tailor shop. And he started this. Uh, he's pictured here with his three children, Belle, Nathan, and Oscar, and his second wife, Ida Druskin. Um, so his second wife um, was a peddler. She was selling women's clothing from door to door, and she motivated him to move from just having the tailor shop to opening a dress shop. The store opened on Dock Street in 1920 and survived through two more generations of ownership. So Bal Hamburg, his daughter, um, took over the store when he retired and then in turn passed it on to her son, Norman Hamburg. The store moved from Dock Street to Union Street in 1976. And then in 1968, for a short period of time, there was a second store location in the Lancaster Mall on the west side. And then in 1994, Druskins moved into the Brunswick Square Mall on King Street, which is where it stayed until it closed on Norman's retirement in 2006. And the store was well known for its sales of quality ladies fashion. So um, very nice things. And I suspect Abraham Druskin still provided some tailoring and alterations in the early stages of that dress shop. 599 Main Street was the Aronoff Secondhand Store, and it was a, also known as the North End, Store, North End Stove Exchange. I don't have a lot on this one, but there was a recollection from Bernie Bloom, and he said, quote, that if you had a messy room, the parents would say your room looked like Aronoff's junk shop. He had things hanging everywhere. So I guess this was a warning to children throughout the Jewish community that their rooms couldn't look like Aronoff's store. But one suspects he probably had a little bit of everything, um, but did ultimately sort of specialize in selling or trading um, kitchen stoves. Um, the Aronoffs were also involved in a fur business, so they were looking for deer skins. Although it's kind of nice that even in 1940s and 1950s, they were warning people not to go hunting and drinking at the same time. And the store also sold reconditioned heaters, um, furnace sets, um, steel cots, they had radios, they had Chesterfields, army blankets, um, skates. So all kinds of things coming into the store that um, needed to be sold. Um, at 609 Main Street, I, for a brief period of time, was Freeman's Ladies' Wear, which was owned by Morris Freeman. I couldn't find anything from the store's time on Main Street, but I did find that the store moved to Union Street. So when I do a Union Street walk, he may turn up again. And by the time they moved to Union Street, it seemed to be more of a men's clothing store where you could buy a suit for... $14.95 as a starting point. So at 615 Main Street, Newfields Millinery, which was taken over by Nathan Meltzer, but had been established by Mr. Newfield in 1928. And the March 1936 newspaper um, noted that the store carried a complete variety of up to the minute millinery. The business was taken over in August 1932 by Nathan Meltzer and Mrs. Nathan Meltzer, who has been the manager since that time. Associated with the present manager is Miss Lillian Meltzer, who was employed for several years by the founder and original owner of the firm. Newfields Millinery enjoys a very large patronage of feminine shoppers from all parts of St. John, as well as its suburbs. For not only do they cater to the tastes of young women who require regular sizes, but they specialize in matrons, large head sizes. Within the last two years, Newfields Millinery has opened up a special department in which they carry hosiery, lingerie, house dresses, as well as kiddies, school dresses, and many other accessories. 
So clearly able to diversify and take care of a time period when all women wore hats, regardless of whether they were going to worship in the synagogue, taking their chickens for a ride on the streetcar for one last trip, um, or even just to go out and visit their friends. <laughs> At 625 Main Street, we can find another tailor shop, this one owned by Max Grossweiner. And he specialized in ladies' coats and suits, and then also went on to sell ready-to-wear items. So an advertisement from March 1932 says, M. Grossweiner, showing the newest in cloths, styles, coats, suits, and dresses. The lady whose coat or suit fits perfectly has her clothes made to measure. The best dressed ladies appreciate the workmanship of Mr. Grossweiner. We make coats, suits, and fur jackets to your individual taste as to style, goods, and price. The quality is always the best and the fit most exact. Bring your cloth or fur coat to be remodeled. Don't overlook our ready to wear department with its large stock of beautiful stylish coats and dresses for spring. Open evenings, St. John's leading ladies tailor. And like many of the wooden buildings of the period, fire is a huge concern. So this building um, where he was, 625 Main Street was damaged by fire at the end of January, 1930. And the building was actually owned by the Garson family. But um, clearly repaired since he was still in business in 1932. At 625 Main Street, we have Sam's Smoke Shop, which was owned by Samuel Everett. And he was selling smokers supplies, magazines, candy, ice cream, and soft drinks. He also sold tickets for wrestling events that were held at the St. John Forum. And he also sold tickets for other sporting events. So he was very much a sports person himself. Um, he was a champion bowler, as you can see in the photograph. I think he's the one holding the trophy. In August of 1943, there was a report in the newspaper of a break-in into the store, which was then at 661 Main Street. And the thieves stole $75 worth of cigarettes and candy. And they also took the store safe. However, they realized that they could not open the safe and the safe was found abandoned on Fort Howe. And the $300 inside the safe was still packed neatly inside. And the newspaper also reported that this was the fifth break-in in within nine months. In 1955, the store was damaged by fire that came from an explosion at the Sterling Electric business located next door at 631 Main Street. So clearly being a business had its challenges, um, buyers, theft. At 629 Main Street, another tailor, Abraham Rosofsky. And our paper from 1936 talks about this store. Um, which had opened in 1921 in the American Ladies Tailoring Limited on the North End. It boasts a high class modern tailoring and fur establishment. On February 1st, the American Ladies Tailoring celebrated its 15th anniversary in the North End. Few people realize that in the North End, it is possible to see fur coats of the highest class and of any kind of fur. So popular had the workmanship of this tailoring and fur establishment become that the ever-growing patronage which it had enjoyed made it possible for the firm to erect an entirely new building at its present location in 1932. The American Ladies Tailoring, of which A. Rozovsky is the proprietor and manager, has become one of the foremost tailoring and fur establishments, not only in St. John, but in the maritime provinces. From all points people come for special work. Remodeling of fur coats is a specialty. And during the busy season, 12 people are employed. So the store was damaged in 1930. And this was the same building um, that was impacted somewhere else. So it was a Garson owned building. And then the American Ladies Tailoring moved to Princess Street before 1950. So in, well in advance of urban renewal. And 
eagle-eyed pedestrians who have to look up, kind of on St. John standards, way up. You can still see the store's name written in the brick on the side of the building as you're walking down the street. So just kind of neat to see that record. A little farther down and across the street is St. John Rye Bakery, which was owned by Sam Fainer at 636 Main Street. And this was probably, I think, the only kosher Jewish bakery in St. John. So he did start out on Main Street, but by the 1930s had relocated to Prince Edward Street. Um, so I don't have a whole lot on that one, but um, it did do well. And then at 637, um, we have Morris Everett had his grocery store. Um, not sure about the um, a lot of detail on this one, but Ben Goldberg's memory of taking the chickens on the streetcar, he did say that they went to a butcher shop um, next to Fainer's Bakery. So this may be where Sarah Brim is bringing her chickens to be slaughtered. <laughs> At 655 Main Street, we have the New York Shoe Store, which was owned by Israel Alming. And he opened this store in the 1920s and was selling men's and women's shoes. And um, let's see, he died in 1940 at the age of 60, but he had been living in St. John for about 30 years. And had come to the city with his wife, Celia. And they had three sons, Isidore, Hyman, and Morris. And Morris or Maury did take over the store for a while. They also adopted a daughter, Naomi, who was part of the group of Lithuanian orphans brought to Canada after the First World War. And when he wasn't selling shoes, he was involved with the St. John Jewish Immigrant Aid Society as its president and was a national vice president of the Jewish Immigrant Aid Society of Canada. He was also the founder of the Ezra Lodge in St. John and was credited as being one of the advocates responsible to amalgamate those two early synagogues in the city into the Sherazetic Synagogue. And he was president of the congregation from 1924 to 1925. And he was also teaching Hebrew school and helping as a leadership in a leadership role with Young Judea. So wasn't just the shoes keeping him busy. Um, Although it looks like you could buy shoes for no more than $3 at his shop in that time period. So, again, very nice prices, nice window display as well. At 655 to 659 Main Street was um, Jacobson, it was either Jacobson's store or Barney's department store. Um, it was um, Barney Jacobson and Barney Everett. And it was described as Barney's department store in March of 1936. So again, from the St. John newspaper. And they, they write that the store has an interesting history. It was founded in 1912 by Barnett Jacobson at 659 Main Street. And this store has catered for many years to the dry goods, clothing and footwear requirements of the entire family. In 1918, Barney Herc Everett became associated with the firm. And after a few years, Mr. Everett started in business for himself a few doors down the street from the present stand. The two firms amalgamated and in 1933 took over the premises at 655 Main Street, formerly the New York Shoe Store, cut through from one store to the other, making one large place, Barney's Department Store. Although incorporated in that year as Jacobson and Everett, they kept the original firm name. This department business has four display windows and a frontage of 50 feet, making it the largest clothing and footwear store in the North End. It enjoys the patronage of many people in all parts of St. John and particularly has it been pleased to serve numerous customers within a radius of 50 miles of St. John. Barnett Jacobson stepped away from the store in 1940, leaving it with Barney Everett. And Bernie Bloom recalled that Barney Jacobson would be seen sitting outside on a chair in the street smoking his pipe and would only get up when a customer appeared. Um, Barney Everett opened a second store to serve uptown customers at 221 Union Street beginning in 1938 and would later have the factory shoe outlet on Charlotte Street. 
and then everything closed when he retired in 1978. On the 40th anniversary of the stories, Barney Everett was quoted in the newspaper, um, it is the policy of Barney's to provide serviceable quality clothing at popular prices for men, women, and children. The belief that a family clothing store should play a part in community service is a fundamental one um, for his store's policy. Um, and there were a couple of other people associated with the business from the Jewish community. So Samuel Rose managed the Union Street store and Louis Slavitt managed the shoe department before he went on to work at Weasel's. So a couple of advertisements. So going out of business on Union Street advertisement and then you know $10 men's top coats um, and having a, a thousand pairs of sneakers in stock to sell at 75 cents each. So be a nice profit in those days if they all sold. At 672, or 724 Main Street. I think there were two different locations. Samuel Koshetsky had his grocery store. Um, and this store, he opened his store in the 1940s. Don't know a whole lot about the business side of his life, however. 673 to 675 was Jacobson and Company. So Harry Meyer and Morris Jacobson. And this was a store that sold furniture and appliances. And just checking to make sure I haven't missed something there. Um, so, and again, a different address. So things move around. So an advertisement for their furniture store. So three rooms of beautiful furniture and you could get the whole thing for just under $500. Now that might buy you, what, one chair? Instead of about 28 pieces of furniture? So I've already talked a bit about Franz Bo's Grocery, uh, but this was the location at 685 Main Street before they moved up to the street to 401 Main Street. And then Max Franz Bo in his military uniform in the years before the store opened in 1947. And then Max Sarisky had a grocery store at 687 Main Street. And again, if we go back to our 1936 um, newspaper feature, and it says, after many years of experience in the meat and cattle business in the northern part of the province, Max Sarisky came to St. John in 1914 and started a small meat business at 687 Main Street. Two years later, he bought the corner building at 616 Main Street, known as the Jones property, and started a small meat store there in the corner room of the street floor. Since then, the store has been gradually enlarged until it now occupies the whole street floor. Sarisky's is an MMA homeowned store, Mr. Sarisky is a director of the MMA. A member of Mr. Sarisky's staff with long experience in serving the public is Mr. Levy, who since the Great War in which he served with the Princess Pats has been clerking for Mr. Sarisky. So the MMA is short for Maritime Merchants Association. And this was a group of 200 independent store owners from New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. They were working together to pool their resources and lower costs for customers in groceries without creating unfair profits for any of its members. So it was described itself as a money-saving, profit-sharing fraternity of maritime independent merchants. And they gathered their materials between seven distribution warehouses um, with locations in St. John, Moncton, Fredericton, Woodstock, Campbellton, Amherst, and Windsor. And he, um, Max Sarisky was also on the board of the Maritime Merchants Association, so was able to contribute in a fairly significant way to the operation of that business. And so in the 1930s, you could get a sirloin steak for 23 cents, a blade roast for nine cents a pound, a leg of lamb for 25 cents, uh, a bag of flour, 24 pound bag of flour for 85 cents. 
um, tea bags for 39 cents, or maybe it was loose tea. And if you needed to clean up because you spilled the tea, a four string broom would only put you back for 29 cents. So 695 Main Street was Hoffman's Tailors. So Meyer Hoffman and his brother, Ben Hoffman. And Meyer Hoffman opened what became the leading men's tailor shop in St. John in 1911. So the 1936 newspaper story describes the story this way. Benjamin and Meyer Hoffman started in the made to measure clothing business in the North End 25 years ago. 10 years ago, they moved to their present spacious and attractive quarters at 695 Main Street. Many style changes have taken place in the quarter of a century Hoffman brothers have been making clothes for the men of St. John. Always well abreast of the times, Hoffman's custom tailored suits or coats assure the latest styles, newest materials and perfect fitting garments. And one of the stories in St. John was that if a man could afford to purchase his suit from Hoffman's tailors, he had arrived. So we have a picture of the building and Mr. Hoffman, and also Mr. Hoffman at work. So inspecting the material and then an advertisement for the store as well. And I would like to thank Louise for sending along the picture of the building and the picture of her father so that we could include them in this walk. And then at 701 Main Street, Benjamin Levine had a butcher shop. And one of the stories in Marsha Coben's book is that she, there was an anecdote that Bessie Levine delivered the meat orders in the winter using a child's sled. And she was wearing men's winter boots to get through the snow. And finally, 703 Main Street, another grocery store, David Aronoff. And the 1936 newspaper, um, wrote this about this building. This firm has taken part in the growth of, North, of the North End for the last 25 years, having been started by David Aronoff in 1911. In former years, the business was devoted entirely to a retail meat trade. But recently the meat department was closed and the firm specializes now in the sale of freshwater fish, groceries and vegetables. The new departure has proved very successful and Aronoff's Grocery is acquiring a large patronage in all parts of St. John. During the last few months, the store has been completely renovated and modern refrigeration has been installed and they deliver groceries to all parts of the city. And in Marcia's book, there was a little notation about Mrs. Lena Aronoff, his wife, and she was doing her addition on an abacus. Now, there are other stores along Main Street, but because I based this walk on who was buried in the cemetery, there were a few others that were owned by men who were not buried in St. John. So there was at 387 Main Street, the Stoller Taylor and Furriers, owned by Morris Stoller, um, the Peter Pan Dress Shop, owned by Samuel Essing at number 413, Morris Lampert's second-hand store at number 555. Barney Swetsky sold clothing at number 557. Bluebird Beverages, um, Adolph Bramberg was in operation at number 562. And Morris Sires had a clothing store at number 685. Close out a couple of more pictures of Main Street, um, St. Luke's Church, in the left-hand picture at the far left side of that photograph. So a couple of the buildings that you see in this section are still standing. And then further down the street and looking toward the uptown of the city, um, probably from the 1950s. So that's today's walk. Um, so I'm hoping uh, once I Stop sharing my screen that you'll share your comments, suggestions, memories. Tell me about all the stuff that I missed. I know I missed something somewhere. And um, just a reminder um, that next week, March the 29th, we'll have another cemetery-based walk. And this one's called 
murder, illness, and accidents. So people whose ends came somewhat earlier than perhaps they should have. And then after a two week break to get us through Passover, we'll come back on the 19th of April. You turn Summer Street. Sound back on unmuted. Of course, my weekly reminder that if you have things to contribute to our upcoming bar mitzvah and, a bit, and bat mitzvah exhibit, um, we're putting that together piece by piece at this point.